Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, just as an administrative matter, before we get started, uh, three quick things. One, if you could just take a look at your cell phone to make sure that it's on silent. Um, two, that this event is live streamed, so we're literally on the on being live streamed onto the internet right now. And three, the event's going to be recorded. Uh, so just so you're aware of all that, if you plan on asking a question at the Q&A session uh, at the end of the talk. So again, good evening and welcome to the University of Pennsylvania <coughs> Carey School of Law and to the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law's third book talk of this academic year. My name is Chris Welsh. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Ethics and Rule of Law. The Searle Book Talk series continues to gain notoriety as we've hosted many distinguished guests over the last few years, such as General Michael Hayden, the director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center, Professor Kathleen Hall Jameson, and the New York Times General Counsel earlier this year, David McCraw. Next semester, we'll also be hosting uh, former director of national intelligence, James Clapper. So be sure to, uh, to look for the date. Um, in keeping with our tradition of hosting distinguished guests to discuss their most recent books, we're honored to have with us tonight Professor Mitchell Ornstein, a professor of Russian and European studies here at the University of Pennsylvania, to discuss his most recent book, the lands in between, Russia versus the West, and the new politics of hybrid war. But before we start the discussion, and I formally introduce Professor Ornstein and our moderator, Searle's founder and faculty director, Professor Claire Finkelstein, I just want to take a brief minute to talk to you a little bit about Searle, what it is that we do. Um, what is our mission? So we're a nonpartisan inter interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting ethics and the rule of law in national security, democratic governance, conflict, and modern warfare. So what does that mean? How do we actually do that? Well, there are four concrete ways that we actually do that. First, we educate the public. We hold a series of book talks like this. We hold a series of public keynote presentations. As I said, we posted on our website. We have a listserv of over 7,000 people that are interested in what we're doing. Uh, we run a blog and we uh, engage with high-level academics and national security professionals in public settings in order to keep the public well informed of pressing national security issues. Second, we educate students. We primarily do this through our summer internship program where students take a deep dive into the pressing national security issues of our day and have the ability to interact with high-level national security professionals. And we also uh, invite our students to participate in the closed door sessions of our conferences that we hold with national security experts. Third, we like to influence policy. So we, we frequently publish policy papers, blog posts, and have briefings at the Pentagon on pressing national security issues. And last, we, we, one of our missions is to, act to, I'm sorry, to advance academic thought. We have, uh, Claire is the co-editor of Searle's <laughs> Oxford University Press volume series, Ethics, National Security, and the Rule of Law. So if you're interested in learning more about the center, uh, please visit our website or talk to me after the, the uh, lecture. Now to introduce our distinguished guests. Professor Mitchell Ornstein is a leading scholar of political economy and international affairs of Central and Eastern Europe. He's a professor and chair of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. In addition to the book we will be discussing today, Professor Ornstein has authored multiple other award-winning books and edited volumes. So thank you, Professor Ornstein, for being with us. And our moderator for tonight's discussion is Professor Claire Finkelstein. As I said, she's the founder and faculty director for Searle. She's the Algernon Bis uh, excuse me, Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Philosophy here at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2019, she was named a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. An expert in the law of armed conflict, military ethics, and national security law, she's the co-editor of our Oxford series, Ethics, National Security, and the Rule of Law. And in 2012, she founded Searle. So thank you all for being here. I hope you enjoy this uh, great discussion. I'll turn it over to Professor Fickerson. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, Mitch has been uh, a friend and a colleague uh, with whom I've been able to consult, and, and he's uh, been wonderful at helping uh, guide some of the work of the center uh, in the area of, of uh, election interference and um, <coughs> Russian interference more generally. And, and so I'm very grateful uh, for your help and advice over the last few years, uh, and now delighted to be able to to talk to you about your book. Uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful book. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading this book. And for someone who is not 
uh, herself a Russia scholar, it was very accessible. Uh, and indeed, uh, Mitch's book will be uh, on sale in the lobby during the reception. And uh, I, I highly recommend it as a uh, winter break read. Um, I want to talk first about the strategy of the book, uh, because it only slowly dawned on me as I was reading, starting to read the book, exactly what the strategy might be. And I wondered whether or not your idea was that by focusing in the lands, on the lands in between, that is the lands that hover precariously between Russian autocracy and Western democracy, you might turn the light, the spotlight on techniques that are in fact imperiling our own Western democracy. Was that sort of the thought behind the book? And Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that, that's the key theme. Um, the way I try to talk about it is that, that, you know, this isn't really a book about the lands in between, in a way, right? It's a book about us. It's a book about Western politics and what people in the Western world can learn from the lands in between. Because essentially the types of politics and the types of electoral interventions and the types of hybrid warfare techniques that you see being played out in Western countries, and I would say not only the US, but also Canada and France and Germany, Britain, are, are the same things that have been happening uh, in the lands in between for some 20 years. In fact, I was writing this book um, for quite a long time before the 2016 election. <laughs> Uh, and this book at that time, when I started originally conceptualizing, was about it was kind of a warning. It was sort of saying, look, I, you know, there's a lot of things going on in Eastern Europe that we need to be concerned about in terms of Russian interven intervention interference, and the West uh, should you know, kind of catch up and be aware of these things. That was the original point. And then when 2016 happened, I have to say that I was pretty surprised. I, I ne it never occurred to me that uh, Russia would use the same exact hybrid warfare techniques against the United States that it had already used extensively against Ukraine and that I was writing about in the book. Um, it just didn't occur to me. I think it was a failure of my imagination. Just like for a lot of us, I think it was a failure of imagination and something like that could happen. Um, but when, I, when it did happen, the thing was that I became instantly aware and highly sensitive to exactly what was going on because I'd seen it all before. I was already writing a book about it. And so it became very much, I had to slightly alter that to be, you know, say, what are the lessons that, that we can learn now that we're subject to the same things from the lands in between? So how, can, can you paint a picture for us of the beginning? You, you described 2007 as a turning point. There are various turning points. What do you see as sort of the, the beginning of these um, hybrid campaigns on Russia's part uh, and, and, and then how did it unfold? Right. Well, there's a huge debate uh, about sort of why Russia is attacking the West. Um, what are its motivations? Is it all about Putin? Is it part of a deeper trend? And I weighed into these debates. In my opinion, uh, Putin, you know, I, I was in Russia teaching in 2000. I was teaching at Moscow State University, which is one of the top universities in Russia. And already in 2000, you could see that Putin was trying to put in place a more nationalistic vision for the country. Uh, and it was anti-Western. I mean, it really was you know, unhappy with the West. But I feel that, that Putin, so you could make the argument that from the beginning, Putin was taking this anti-Western approach. On the other hand, uh, I, don't, I think that, that, that um, it wasn't entirely the case. And uh, he was still making overtures to the United States, for instance, after 9-11. Uh, in which he made a major overture to the United States and uh, tried to get the United States engaged in a war against terror that would you know, cooperate with Russia. So I don't think the die was really set that early. In my view, the, the key turning point probably happened around 2006 and 2007. There were a number of different causes you could point to, but to me the biggest one was the international uh, intervention or recognition in Kosovo. Uh, it was really more about um, you know, at the time, Russia really said very clearly, if you intervene in Kosovo, which was seen by them as going into Serbia, um, you know, and taking away a piece of Serbia and making it its own country, which in fact contravened all sorts of international law. And the United States and Western allies had to make up a variety of different justifications to, to do that. 
then we will retaliate. And we're going to retaliate specifically in Georgia, where we will uh, say South Ossetia and Abkhazia are, should be independent for the same reasons. And uh, they basically, you know, in, in 2008 with the Russo-Georgian War, uh, made good on those kind of promises. So for me, there are other things going on. Uh, Putin's Munich Security Conference speech, which happened in 2007, a kind of long, kind of complicated relationship Russia had with the EU that resulted in a lot of disillusion and moving away. But in my opinion, this was, there were probably a series of government meetings and think tank papers and ideas commissioned towards a Eurasian turn for Russia that, that probably solidified around 2006, 2007. And by 2007, the die was cast and they were in full, you know, sort of an all out kind of attack on Western institutions. As I say in the book, unfortunately, the West didn't really recognize it at the time. So even though Russia was really clear about its st statements and, and saying these things publicly and invaded Georgia in 2008, many Western states and many Western governments did not believe it was happening, did not believe that Russia had departed from the West until about 2012 and 2014 with the Crimea invasion. And I think that's, a, that's why it's interesting to talk about why we feel like we're on the back foot here is because we are in a, we have been on the back foot for quite a long time. And it's taken quite a long time for Western institutions and people to understand, in fact, what is happening. So describe the, the variety, of, variety of techniques that Russia has been using. Um, it's, the book is really um, helpful in that regard for, for filling out a picture of these gray zone techniques. Right. Uh, or techniques that are used that hover in between war and peace. Absolutely. So that's one of the one of the key aspects of this conflict, I, I think, is its asymmetric kind of nature, essentially, where it's it's very clear that economically and militarily, US and Western institutions, NATO, European Union, have the preponderance of economic power and the preponderance of military power. Russian conventional power is probably not enough even to face the West Europeans. Um, and so as a result, Russia has uh, tried to attack the West through more covert uh, methods that you could say are basically asymmetric. Okay. A lot of people would say, well, why should we worry about Russia, right? Because Russia is so weak, you know. And, and the answer is because these asymmetric uh, tactics really work. I mean, they work extremely well. And, and you call, you're calling them asymmetric not in the sense of asymmetric war of a state versus non-state actors. What, what you're calling them asymmetric because they're sort of hybridized and not being used by the other side. Is I think I think I call them asymmetric just because that's that helps people to understand um, why they're choosing to use these hybrid war techniques. Okay. Right. So they're they're using they're using them because they're the weaker power. Right. Right. And so, like a non-state actor attacking a state actor. You would you would change your techniques. You can't you can't send tanks in right necessarily right. But though they have, <laughs> well to Ukraine you can. But I mean they couldn't go much further as right as, right. Um, you know and um, so it's it's more useful for them to use these types of techniques, techniques. So, because so they just, don't want to yeah. they don't want to cause a armed conflict with the West that they right. would surely lose, you know, without, of course, nuclear weapons. So let's but, describe these techniques. So what's interesting about the range of the techniques is the range of them. And I think this is something also that people have a hard time getting their head around. And, and in part, I don't think that the Russia hearings, um, the Mueller report, really helped very much in this respect because it focused in a way too much attention. Not that it was wrong, but it, it focused a lot of attention on social media, right? If you think about the Mueller report, they're really talking about two different things. They were talking about hacking. So Russia is hacking the democratic servers and taking information and dumping it online. Right. And then social media, um, propaganda. You know, propaganda, sort of, you know, making more vociferous, you know, comments on both sides and sort of hook people into different social media networks, the Tennessee GOP or, you know, Black Lives Matter kind of websites that they were running. So. Um, but it, it goes way beyond that, way beyond that. And I'm actually uh, a little bit disappointed in the Mueller report in particular that it didn't look at the issue of party financing. Hmm. Um, to spend a word on that, I would say, you know, in, what, when, I, when writing this book, is, is, um, you know, one of the, the 
things I got to communicate is like, I'm not just looking at the US. I'm looking at about 20, 20 countries, right? And I see patterns happening in country after country. And then I see these patterns playing out in the US. In a lot of cases, um, there isn't direct evidence, you know, that all this is happening. But I would say that in almost all cases uh, where Russia is seeking to influence politics, it often uses money. And it basically is trying to, uh, to uh, funnel money to what we would call extremist parties, um, or might more appropriately be defined as anti-Western parties or anti-EU parties in particular. So Russia will often fund anti-EU EU parties of the right, um, like uh, National Front in France, for instance, or Octaka in Bulgaria. They will also funnel them to anti-EU parties of the left, including d for instance. Um, and the common thing they have together is that these parties that they finance are typically against the sort of uh, dominant institutions of, of the West. And in addition, they fund mainstream parties. Um, so uh, there's a big scandal in the UK right now where uh, the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee of the British Parliament has prepared a report which I believe, and you know, in the various leaks that have happened to the papers, uh, you know, implicates the Tory party of having had a huge amount of donations from Russian business spend who are connected with the government. And Boris Johnson doesn't want, has decided not to release this report prior to the election. Um, because of course he's worried that it's going to implicate his own party. So, so now, this think, is this is separate from the report about Brexit or is it, this is the same report? Yeah, this is the, uh, it, well, it, it deals with Brexit and also okay. other, other things. And so, so if we look at this variety of techniques, just to give the overview. Which I'm only getting started on. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but I would say that's, that's really important. Propaganda, hacking, financing. Fi party finance is a huge thing. And I would just be very clear to say that, in my opinion, uh, in the US, Russia heavily financed um, uh, Donald Trump's election campaign. I believe that I would say that on the basis of some considerable evidence of that which is particularly, I don't know if you followed the Maria Butina case, but Maria Butina's handler, Torshin, um, showed up at an NRA conference, and we have photographs of him wearing a yellow jacket, which is the jacket that they give to million dollar donors to the NRA. Right? Um, the NRA spent uh, far more on uh, this presidential election than past elections, and that money went not only to the presidential campaign, but also probably went to all GOP uh, or most GOP congressional races as well, because the NRA just, that's who they fund, primarily GOP, uh, probably some Democrats as well. Um, so now, now, to be clear, this claim about funneling money through the NRA mm -hmm. has, has, was mentioned in mainstream press, but has not been fully substantiated, I take it. Well, as far as I understand, the Federal Election Commission um, started an investigation. That investigation was then quashed by the Republican Party. Um, I don't know yet why Mueller didn't investigate it, honestly, but I think we'll, we'll find out that. But I just, uh, I, I feel 100% certain that this happened. I, of course, that's just my judgment as a, as a scholar. My judgment is, again, having looked at patterns, you know, from all these different countries and seen these similar things happening. But you're right that, that these things have not been substantiated, but that's interesting why it hasn't been. But that's to say that a lot, that that's, helps you to understand why these hybrid techniques work so well. Okay. It's because the whole point is that it's hard to substantiate what's going on. Okay, right? so, so And so in addition to these things um, that I've mentioned, there's a bunch of other techniques that are being used as well. One of, and some of them, some of them, these ones fall on the side of sort of covert, you know, quiet, you know, behind the scenes. But others do verge into the area of military threats. Um, so for instance, as you, as you pointed out, Russia did in fact invade Ukraine with, you know, weapons and tanks and other things, right? Um, and, uh, and, and Russia also <coughs> makes a lot of threats uh, against countries that are military threats. For instance, I don't know how many people were paying attention, but, but Vladimir Putin a few months ago, and re recently again reiterated, that Russia is developing all these hypersonic nuclear weapons, essentially, that could basically be parked off of the coast of Houston or off the coast of DC even, I suppose. And, and attack you know U.S. cities within minutes with nuclear weapons, right? And he's not joking about that, I don't think. You know, but the the um, Russia very often will um, respond to perceived threats through what I would call nuclear saber rattling. Mm -hmm. You know, or um, and and the reason I think is very clear is that as I mentioned that uh, in conventional force 
the West has a preponderance. In economic power, we have a preponderance. But in nuclear, power, in nuclear weapons, we're kind of at parity, right? Mm -hmm. And so just as the US uses as its primary means, or the West uses as its primary means in the conflict, economic sanctions to which Russia can't respond, Russia often will retaliate with sort of nuclear threats, which it feels that uh, is, a, is a ground on which it's more, on more even footing, I think, with the West. So of these techniques, right? So the techniques we could call hybrid, techniques of hybrid war. Mm -hmm. That's a description of the way the war is being fought. Mm -hmm. And the concept of gray zone conflict is a type of conflict in which we have not crossed the threshold into armed conflict, say. Correct. Um, and what is the point mm -hmm. of using these techniques? I and mean, what is it that Russia is trying to gain by doing this? I think the, that's a great question. And I think this is, this is one of the key reasons I wrote this book, because yeah. Like just very basic things about this conflict are totally mysterious to everybody. <laughs> like why are they doing this, right? You know, what are they hoping to get out of it? I mean, I think if you look at Russian military doctrine and a lot of this stuff has been written about gray zone or hybrid war or new generation conflict, I think the key, the key objective is to disable the enemy from within, right? So warfare, you know, is conducted to disable your enemy, right, and prevent them from attacking you and to sort of gain, you know, certain resources. Um, Russia realized that through this new generation warfare, hybrid warfare, it could um, make itself safer by disabling its enemies and preventing them ever from attacking. So if you ask yourself today, for instance, um, let's just take Britain. It's always easier to think about these things in some other place rather than your own country. So I'll try to use examples that are not the US. But if you look at Britain today and you see the chaos that's going on with Brexit, and I would just say to you, you know, what's the chances that were Britain attacked, they would actually be able to respond to in an armed conflict or make a decision about nuclear attack, you know, attack versus vis-a-vis -vis Russia right now, I think you'd have to say that, you'd have to admit that it's pretty low, right? This is, this is a country whose politics have become totally disorganized, right? Mm -hmm. And may not be able to um, stand up to any sort of actual military threat. And I think the same thing is the objective in the United States. The objective clearly is that, you know, if you think about Russia now wants to invade, let's say, Estonia, right? Would the U.S. respond? Right. Once it's been disabled in the way that it has, you know, we have Trump going over to the NATO summit and casting doubt again, you know, for the nth time on whether the United States would declare Article Five. Um, so, you know, basically, it, it can give uh, the country, you know, more leeway in international affairs if it's disabled its decision-making structures. So, and throw the country into chaos, disable it from responding, mm -hmm. um, create internal divisions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, polarize the country right. so that we have extreme factions within it and and then once the enemy is disabled it's easier to have your way without yeah. having to uh, actually fight a war to, to get it. Absolutely. And if the U.S. is disabled, then it makes it less I encouraging for Germany to keep up, you know, fighting or for France or if France decides that it wants to pull out uh, and you know, take a more pro-Russia policy. So every, every bit of pressure that they're applying on all the different countries in the West sort of progressively disables the others as well from taking action. Right, so um, what if Russia had proceeded in a more overtly uh, military fashion? At that point, you expect countries to, to mobilize, and indeed we have come to the defense of Ukraine and so on, uh, where it has taken those actions. But when it keeps its attack just below the level mm -hmm. of, of acts of war or mm -hmm. use of force, is there a kind of you know, boil the frog slowly effect where we only very, very slowly start to realize what is going on, and meanwhile we're being sort of eroded from within. Is that is that your thesis? Yeah, I, th I think that's that's more or less exactly right. I, I've given a uh, talk about the book at um, U.S. Army War College, for mm -hmm. instance, and there, you know, they, they hit me with questions like, okay, so if we're cyber attacked, does that 
mean we should trigger Article 5. They're, they're debating these things within right, the military course. right now. Uh, you know. And we're about to debate that for a day and a half mm -hmm. in a conference. A number of people in the audience are from that conference, a uh, workshop style event to try to talk about the implications for armed conflict and, and national defense. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, on the other hand, I a little bit bridled the idea of uh, the boiling the frog metaphor, because in a way, some of this was pretty sudden, right? I mean, so the, the, the elevation to power of people who have a much more sympathetic, mm -hmm. you know, view towards Russia in the U.S. was pretty sudden, uh, sudden change. And you know has disabled things. I mean, the, for instance, the U.S. military has a variety of different cyber methods and ways that it could deal with um, you know the cyber attacks and deal with the social media. Those programs are sort of lined up, primed, ready to go. But the Trump administration doesn't want to pull the trigger on those things. They they will say no. We we want to hold back from that. And there's been a whole interesting dynamic, frankly, inside the Trump administration of those who have been uh, very uh, strong on Russia, and those have been, uh, you know, uh, trying to accommodate Russia. Um, you know, so you don't know exactly how it's going to play out. But that, that, un that uncertainty, I think, came up on the U.S. Uh, rather quickly. Now, now, one of the techniques you haven't mentioned, but, but you do in the book, is um, gaining political control mm -hmm. over whoever is in power or, indeed, working to, um, you know, place a person in power, not just by funding, but by personal allegiance and indeed possibly blackmail. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a little bit that, that aspect and do you consider that part of the techniques of hybrid war? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly yes. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, the, the, you're asking a question which is a perfectly great question, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, where's the pee tape, you know? <laughs> you know, and, and, and the thing is, the, the whole thing about blackmail and dealing with, you know, analyzing as a public analyst, like analyzing covert behavior of states is you don't really know exactly what they have on people or exactly how they're applying this, in, this you know. So I would say that, um, but I could imagine a whole lot of ways that this could be done. You know, for instance, um, if you had, as a, the Russian government or any arm of the Russian government, supported a political campaign in a country, right, and that was largely unknown to other people or was seen as potentially scandalous, simply releasing, you know, emails, right, data, oh yeah, we gave you this amount of money, that was the GRU, could be enormously damaging, particularly like at this moment in time. Imagine if um, Russia released a, a, an email of a GRU officer to a Trump campaign official, right, that was directly related in any way. That would be enough blackmail. Do we have any evidence of, of use of these techniques in other countries? Sort of, again, focusing yes. on... So, so give us some of the examples that you walk through in the book. Um, well... You know, um, direct examples of blackmail of or, or of trying to control I, I politicians. That, I think that you know the reality is that the blackmail I'm sure does exist, but we know least about it. What we do know a lot about is more the the support side of it. Yeah. You know, so um, Russia for politicians, I think you everybody recognize like the two sort of elements of oxygen that you can give to a politic politician is media. Mm -hmm. And money, and money right. right? Those are the two things that usually they're lacking. Right? They often have a lot of charisma, a lot of policy positions, but they're lacking in media and money. And Russia has been very generous, particularly with uh, certain politicians, of media support. Uh, so it provided a huge amount of media support, by the way, to uh, the Green Party in the U.S. to right. Jill Stein. Now there's that famous picture of Jill Stein sitting mm -hmm. with um, Russians and Republicans at a at a dinner. Correct. Um, yeah, and and that, right, was, that that famous picture that has Mike Flynn and exactly. has Jill Stein on the other side of the table. Yeah, I've been looking at that recently. It, it looks like what that was was a congratulatory. So she she has uh, frequently said that the Russian media, the RT, which is Russia Today, um, d did a huge service for third parties in the United States. Right. right? By essentially putting them on TV, right? I mean, third-party candidates in the U.S. very often can't get high-production value television, right? And so Russia Today uh, hosted Green Party debates, mm -hmm. had her on numerous times on TV. 
Um, and let's forget about Jill Stein for a second. Let's talk about Nigel Farage, who, okay, right. who is even more prominent, who's admitted to having been paid as well um, by Russia today for uh, his television appearances at times. So what they're doing is like to recruit some fringe politicians. All that may be necessary is to provide a lot of media support. So then, you know, nobody watches the RT in the U.S., right? And so that's very limited. But what what you can do, of course, is you can then uh, email all these you know debates to your uh, supporter base, and mostly people are watching them on YouTube, essentially, and they have quite a large circulation on, on YouTube, um, you know, in the in the millions. So. Um, so I think that, um, that that has been one really effective technique. Another technique we know about a bit from, um, from, from Britain and from the Leave campaign is promises of financial uh, benefit. So for instance, Aaron Banks, um, who was the bag man, he was the money man behind the Leave campaign. He gave the largest political donation ever in British history um, to the Leave campaign. He's a kind of small businessman. Nobody really knows where he got the money from. But during the campaign, uh, he was uh, several, he didn't admit, but later admitted that um, he had had many meetings at the Russian embassy. Uh, he had had a couple of boozy lunches with the Russian ambassador, and he was promised to share in a gold mine. So this is a typical Russian technique, is that they will uh, offer you like a sliver of some sort of uh, rentier business, like you know, a share in a sort of highly, in a gas contract or something like that. Um, and so there, that's an obvious way to sort of pay people off. We know less about the blackmail side of that, but I'm sure that also happens. Let, let's talk for a minute about Brexit, mm -hmm. um, because we have a little bit of evidence about how these techniques might have operated there. And indeed, Nigel Farage was friends with Steve Bannon, mm -hmm. uh, apparently, and, and that is how, uh, and also had worked with Cambridge Analytica, mm -hmm. which is how Bannon got on to Cambridge mm -hmm. Analytica, um, I gather. So there are connections. Um, but, but tell us a little bit about what we know about Russian influence on Brexit. Right. So I mean, from, from all I can tell in the media is that um, Bannon, Cambridge Analytica, Mercers, certain elements of Russian intelligence had felt that they had common interests okay, and cooperated fairly extensively in both the election campaign in 2016 and in the Brexit campaign, which was happening around the same time, the world before. Um, and the common interest, as I suppose from Steve Bannon's side, is that they, they shared an antipathy towards traditional sort of institutions in the West, wanted to tear them down believed more in nationalism, uh, believed that they may have had a commonality in sort of Christian white nationalism kind of uh, discourse, uh, wanted to see that promoted, were more authoritarian in their mindset, mm -hmm. less interested in uh, you know, fake democracy, saw democracy as a threat in part because of demographic trends that were happening in the West for various reasons, and, and basically cooperated you know, across platforms, I would say. Yeah. So in, in the Brexit campaign, um, you know, it's interesting because because this report, one of the interesting things about our investigations in the U.S., although they have been imperfect, we have gained quite a lot of information out of the Mueller report, and I think we're gaining a fair amount of information out of the impeachment hearings we're having right now. Interestingly, in Britain, it's like an information desert, you know, about this stuff. So because this report has never been released, by the way, it was said that the report has been quashed for a few months. My understanding has been quashed for a, a few years and that this report existed already um, immediately after the leave vote. Um, you know, within months, the Intelligence Security Committee did put this together, um, and nobody wanted to release it, and the Theresa May gave the government either, mm -hmm. because uh, it was just too damaging to Brexit. And of course, they're limping through this Brexit process. The last thing they need is a report that says that Russia funded it all, you know. So- It's interesting, though, that those trying to stop Brexit didn't want to use it. I mean, apparently, neither side wanted to release it. Um, who, who didn't want to stop it? I mean, in, in the Britain, you have the Tory party and you have the Labour party. Both of them are Brexit parties, in my opinion, right? So you didn't really have a, you would have to have had a majority on the committee, uh, as I understand, to release the report. Um, and they never had, and then the government would have to support it. So it was, it was I, I do agree that in general, the UK appears to be uh, more sanguine about foreign influence. Like, they don't seem to be as bothered in a way that somebody would have intervened in their election. And they tend to downgrade it. But I think in large part it's because they haven't really had 
adequate investigations, and nobody's really played out, you know, uh, put out there what it was. So what is, what is the evidence we have that Russians contributed to at least funding Brexit? It's largely what I mentioned before around Aaron Banks, right? Mm -hmm. So Aaron Banks had unclear methods of financing. We don't know where his money came from. He donated the biggest, <coughs> it's, it's acknowledged that he's donated the biggest ever campaign contribution. However, he's not in British history, but he's not the biggest business person in the country. He's mm -hmm. kind of a small time internet insurance salesman. You know, so, so where did the money come? The and, and he is has that? a lot of Russia ties. Like he has businesses. You know, so they're in the Cayman Islands. So it's it seems like. And then there's then it came out. Revelations came out. I forget exactly why they came out. I think that there was uh, into that there had been an investigation that that did happen that um, showed that he had met several times with the Russian ambassador during the campaign and that he had been offered. Uh, you know, some share in a gold mine, you know. So you can put two and two together there, it seems to me, but um, So it's I think not that, knock down, drag out evidence, but it's, yeah, it's, it's strong it's, circumstantial evidence. Yeah, I mean, I think that honestly what we're going to find in reality when the report comes out, and what, what's been happening is that since eventually a, a Tory former, um, former minister, Dominic Grieve, stood up and said, we need to release this report. Right before the election, and he was shattered down. And it's not going to happen. But that happened a few months ago, and he he had been Home Secretary and said, "Look, this is serious. We need to announce it." And the Johnson, he had been kicked out of. He was one of the Tories who was kicked out, and um, and Boris Johnson decided not to release it. But what that report ultimately will show, a number of things leaked out afterwards that I took to be like people leaking things out of the report. And one of the things was that um, a lot more money. Uh, than you would think also came into the Tory party itself. So I think that, that the Banks thing and the Farage thing are definitely going to be borne out, right? Um, but I think it's going to be a lot bigger than that. No, well. let's co contrast Britain with France. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we have somewhat better proof that, um, that for example, extreme right-wing mm -hmm. candidate Marine Le Pen, another right-wing candidate, were, were receiving uh, Russian funds. Mm -hmm. uh, you point out in the book that Le Pen actually had a visit to the Kremlin, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and and moreover that she uh, voiced support mm -hmm. for Russia in the uh, conflict surrounding right. Ukraine and Crimea. Um, and and you say in the book that this was sort of a trade-off, right? They mm -hmm. they buy politicians by funding their campaigns and then expecting them to pledge allegiance to to Russia. Is what what proof do we have of this? Well, I think the I think that uh, as you mentioned, there there are a few cases where there is real information out there in, in the space that is public. Right. And um, I think that uh, France is, of course, one of them. So Marine Le Pen, probably many of you know, Marine Le Pen has been a fixture on the French political scene for quite a long time. She's the leader of the uh, Nationalist French uh, Party, which is. Uh, Kind of anti-immigrant, you know, uh, yeah. in the past it was anti-Jewish, I don't know if it is anymore. And her father, Marie Le Pen, before her, yeah. was also a fixture yeah. on the right-wing political party. So she's part of the dynasty that is, right. you know, so they're, they're, um, her party, uh, the, way the, uh, the, uh, the way the party finance system works in France is that, um, they, is that they give you, the state gives you money based on your share of the vote, right? after the election, right? Because they don't know your share of the vote before the election. So after the election, if you got 20% of the vote, you get more money than some of the party that got 5% of the vote, right? right? But because there's a sort of gap between when you have the election campaign and you get paid, they borrow the money from banks, right? And they go to the banks and say, well, look, our last election result was 25%, and so we're expecting, you know, our polls are saying it's around 25%, so we need X amount of money, and you should give us this bridge loan, essentially, until we get paid from the state. And because of her extremist parties and extremist views, no French bank would touch Marine Le Pen's campaign simply because they didn't want to lose customers. So, um, so uh, she sought money from a Russian bank um, and was given loans. The reported loans were nine million. I think actually there were a couple tranches, and maybe more than that. But um, but she she basically was funded, financed her campaign was out of Russia. And then during the campaign, she traveled to Russia. Um, she met at the Kremlin with, I don't think, she, I don't know if she, I think she met with Putin at one time. She met with a number of other important officials. And previously she even went to Crimea um, and visited Crimea and made statements. So I think from that one can glean that 
that there is this kind of quid pro quo here, that, that Russia is uh, happy to give your, uh, your political campaign support. And it doesn't really demand too much in, in exchange for that. But it does ask for a couple things. One is that you uh, don't say anything bad about Russia. Rather, if you're given the opportunity, you say positive things about Russia, like about President Putin and various things. But in particular, <laughs> that you say something uh, positive, that you support Russia's foreign policy aims in Crimea in particular. So what you find, I would say that uh, that given the lack of information we have, right, for me, the, the sort of key litmus test to whether you're receiving, your party is receiving support from Russia is that you came out in support of um, annexation of Crimea. And the reason I say that is because I can't understand for life of me what benefit it would be to have that position in any Western country. Is that an electoral issue that people campaign on? Oh yeah, I think it's great. We should. It's great that Russia can it. I mean, it's just implausible as a as a campaign platform. But it's something that clearly is 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 pleasurable to Russia to hear. And so I would generally presume that those politicians who support uh, Crimea or surprisingly are always saying something positive about Russia. We're paid, essentially, and are concerned that um, that relationship might be revealed. So, so now speaking of quid pro quo, uh, let's turn to Ukraine and the current impeachment hearings, because obviously this is um, what your work has set, helped to set the background to understand. Um, can you describe a little bit the situation in Ukraine? There's been a lot of uh, uh, attempt to explain this to the American public, um, but, but it'd be interesting to hear your expert views on it. And the situation Ukraine was in um, when the request to uh, support uh, the president's electoral uh, bid came in. Right. Well, first of all, I'd like to say about Ukraine that Ukraine is the place that, that really Russia uh, used as a testing ground for a lot of its hybrid warfare techniques. Ukraine has faced um, power station shutdowns that were done through cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. It's faced electoral interventions starting from 2004 when there were so blatant. At that time in 2004, Russia hadn't really refined its techniques of electoral intervention. So what it did in 2004 in Ukraine is it went into the federal election server as the election results were coming in and like booped up you know, the support for <laughs> for Yanukovych by like five points, like in a way that was very, very visible to anybody who was watching the thing come in on TV, for instance, or on the computer, right? And that was what sparked so the Orange Revolution. Actual hacking. Actual into hacking into the, the uh, election machinery. Actual hacking, which by the way, they did in the US, of course, too, right? In so the voter registration system. Well, that's what was told to us, yeah. Okay, but we, it right. was told to us that Russia hacked into our voter registration and electoral systems. And that it wasn't a big deal. Uh, I'm not sure I totally believe that. But in any case, I'll just stop with the point of saying they hacked into our electoral system. Okay. So, but they realized, I think, that, um, that, well, what happened as a result of that was the Orange Revolution, where basically the Ukrainians came out in the street and said, this has been a falsified electoral result. They had really good evidence of this because you could see the kind of spike happening, right? And, um, and they went out and annulled the election results. In 2004, as a result of mass protests, um, the election results were annulled. And, um, and they reran the election, and the other candidate won. This was Yanukovych versus Yushchenko. So, um, so there's that about Ukraine. Um, by the way, it also happened in, um, in, I believe, 2010 or 2015 election where uh, Russia again had that kind of blatant attack, where they basically hacked into the computer servers in Ukraine and elevated this guy who was a fringe candidate who got actually 1% of the vote. They declared him the winner. Um, and if Ukrainian counter hackers hadn't realized that like a few minutes before the election results went public, they would have declared this fringe crazy candidate the winner when in fact he got 1% of the vote. So um, it's interesting because they don't seem entirely interested in covering their tracks. They almost seem to want to flaunt the fact that they have the capacity to, to hack into these systems and to to affect election right. results. In a way, they're playing with our heads. A, right? a bit, right? yeah. So, so in other words, they want us to know that they can hack our elections. 
Right, because that diminishes trust in the system. I have That's to say right. it's worked effectively on me. I'm much less trustful right. of electoral machines. I, I, I'm a, I kind of like those kinds of levers that you used to push and they were very mechanical. It seems like part though, of it. Though there were always the time. hanging chads. We have to remember that. But I mean, no system's way. perfect, but I think at this point we need to go to hand-marked paper ballots, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We need to go back to very, very low-tech methods where everybody's like actually ticking off, you know, things with their own signatures because it's a lot harder to hack. Now, there's always ways you can fudge everything, right? But right. you can't do this wholesale computer hacking. Okay, so so come to the to, if you will, um, what happens in Ukraine between then and now, um, and the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, uh, and what the the current president Zelensky is dealing with in in uh, right. fighting off Russian aggression. So of course, of course, everybody knows that. Russia invaded uh, Crimea in 2014. It didn't admit that it was invading it at the time. It said, oh, there's people showing up there. We don't really know who they are. They were called the, they were called the little green men who right. showed up. And, um, and that was another hybrid war technique of actually invading a place, but sending up but so many proxies. disinformation signals around that nobody could really tell oh, who is it who's invading right. our country. Um, and they were subject to a whole wide range of things, and uh, including invasion, including then the invasion of, of Donetsk and Lukas. Um, uh, and so the United States' response um, was controversial at the time. The United States, um, of course, with the European Union, uh, put sanctions on Russia that have been very damaging for the economy. I've been a, a supporter of the sanction regime and a defender in, in, of the fact that that was a reasonable response to make to this. Because at the time the Obama administration, administration was not interested in a wholesale war with Russia, they didn't want to escalate. So we didn't, uh, for instance, um, provide military hardware to Ukraine. Right. Um, well, Republicans at the time, interestingly, were advocating that. So generally speaking, Republicans in Congress at the time were advocating more forceful resistance to Russia. And we're trying to get, in particular, Javelin anti-tank missiles um, released to Ukraine and sold to Ukraine. And that, and that is, of course, a Cold War legacy. And we always knew, all of us, um, you know, watching developments in U.S.-Russian relations, assumed the Republicans were anti-Russian and mm -hmm. Democrats were either neutral or, or, you know, even sometimes pro-Russia. And now the and, politics seem to have completely reversed. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, at that time, it was still true in 2014 that Republicans were advocating a tougher line on Russia, right. for sure. Not, it wasn't, like, massively different. So, you know, Democrats were sanctions, Democrats were military aid, but the degree was a little bit higher with the Republicans um, who, you know, both at the expert level and the political level. And then, of course, came 2016, and what happened there, it seemed to me, so... The way I read the Trump approach, you know, obviously he, he had made some deal with the Russians where he was getting some type of support for his election, which you still don't know fully about. In exchange, uh, what the Russians wanted was to drop the sanctions regime. I say that because that came out very clearly from the Michael Flynn case, where Michael Flynn clearly was on the record in all those recordings of he was talking about sanctions, right, and about dropping sanctions, right? And that's why he went to prison, because he did that before he actually came into office. And um, and then lied about it, and then lied about that to Congress. So um, so it seems pretty clear that there that was the quid pro quo that was being negotiated. And um, in that, you know, it's not in a way Trump's approach was not, except for the electoral support, not very different from Obama's approach or Bush too before, mm -hmm. who had both come into office trying to offer uh, a better putting U.S.-Russia <laughs> relations on a better footing. And trying to sort of improve the relationship, you know, Obama had his reset. Bush too, if you remember, looked into Putin's eyes and saw his Russian soul, and you know, <laughs> was was trying to advance this thing. So there's there's a kind of you know back and forth in in U.S. attitudes towards Russia of on the one hand wanting to embrace Russia, on the other hand really rejecting Russia. And so Trump's idea was, look, we need to be more friendly. He said that countless times during the campaign. We need to be more friendly with Russia. It's also the good of this country if we have a better relationship with Russia. And what he was going to do is just simply drop the sanctions regime uh, and leave in place you know, all the Russian gains that they've made you know, and, and, and control over Ukraine. 
Now, his administration, however, being traditional Republican administration, has in fact been split. And one of the very odd things about the Trump administration, I think, has been that they have two different, from the beginning, they had two different Ukraine policies, right? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, um, sanctions were increased under Trump, partly because of votes of the US Congress, Republicans mm -hmm. in Congress. Um, and also, Javelin missiles got sold to Ukraine, um, which Obama had not wanted. And, and Trump will often say, which is partly true, I've been tougher on uh, Russia than anybody else. Right? And he, he says that, you know, he can say that, I think it's honestly partly true, right? <laughs> At the same time, um, he obviously uh, was very interested in selling Ukraine out, right, to Russia, right? And so this makes it very complicated, again, for anybody on the outside to understand what in the world is going on here, right? what is happening? Like, how could you be both soft on Russia and hard right. on Russia at the same time? Right. And I think, I think the answer is really clear. And, and this is a key theme of the book, is that in, country, in a conflict situation, a lot of times people who rise to power are not really on one side or the other of this conflict, but sort of use the conflict right. to, to help themselves to gain resources for themselves and to gain political power for themselves. And in this case, um, Trump found that he could get money from Russia to support Russian objectives and get money from Ukraine, <laughs> or political support from Ukraine to support his objectives. If you think about it, the July, in order to basically advance his own electoral right. objectives. If you think about it, the, the thing that nobody has commented on, I think, about the July 25th conversation, the famous one between Trump and Zelensky, the thing that's notable to me about that conversation is that Trump is offering to send Ukraine javelin missiles to shoot at Russian tanks. Yes. <laughs> right? At a time when he is clearly allied with Russia. Right? He's clearly sympathetic to Russia, wants to drop sanctions, happy to have Russia take over Ukraine as it's part of its back. Yard. Now, now, do you think he really intends to do that, or he's just trying to increase the size of the carrots so that he can better secure their His administration did, in fact, sell these Bureau Javelin missiles to Ukraine. And he's got Bolton, right. On the one hand, he's hiring first right. someone like Rex Tillerson and then right. someone like Bolton. And, uh, of course, those two didn't see eye to eye at all. Right. Uh, with regard to Russia. So that's the, that's the two sides that you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. So yeah. the, the way it plays out is that, you know, it's very simple. The, the decision strategy is very simple here. It's like anybody willing to support his electoral campaign will get whatever they want. Right? It doesn't matter if you're fighting a war with somebody else. It doesn't matter. Right? He would happily sell the Javelin missiles to, to Ukraine. And if Russia said, complained about it, he'd sell something to them too. You know what I mean? <laughs> as long as he was getting the support for himself. And in this, I think that, that he's very, very similar. And I think this is one of the key lessons of the book. We didn't go into the domestic politics and the Europe angle for this. But the key, I think, takeaway of the book, in a way, is that that type of politics is really common in the lands of Ukraine. Right. So there's lots of politicians and stories that I follow through the book that are about people who seem to be on both sides of the conflict in very confusing ways, in ways that are very confusing to Americans. Because Americans usually like to see the world in a more black and white sort of perspective. Right? They're friends or they're enemies. We have long-term alliances. We have enemies. Um, Russia, I don't think they really see things entirely like that. And, and particularly, the countries in between don't feel like they have the, the, the ability necessarily always to do that. And so what they prefer to do is just to maneuver for temporary uh, advantage. I have cases, for instance, in Slovakia of, of officials, defense officials, who, who got a medal from John Kerry for being big supporters of NATO, that the next week were allowing Russian bikers, you know, gangs to like traverse their territory in a, in a sort of like, you know, propaganda campaign, right? Or the case of um, Moldovan former, uh, well, kingpin, um, Vlad Plahotniuk, who on the one hand was positioned his party, the Democratic Party, as being the biggest supporter of the EU in Moldova, at the same time that he was also in his core businesses, um, uh, he was the biggest uh, broadcaster of Russian propaganda in Moldova. So he was making money from Russian propaganda while at the same time uh, making money from EU contracts, right? And it figured out that basically the EU was going to give him more money if Russian propaganda was more effective in Moldova. 
<laughs> which is like a brilliant idea. <laughs> Unbelievable, right. But, but it worked, and, and I think also you could look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, who is a member of the European Union. He's like, he, and he's, he's positioned himself as a very pro-Putin politician mm -hmm. within the EU, and he's made a lot of energy deals with Russia. And you would think, okay, well, that's dangerous for him to do, maybe he'll lose EU support. No, the opposite. The more he cozies up with Putin, the more valuable he is to the EU to keep him on side. And the more contracts are coming, the less likely the EU is to criticize his authoritarian behavior in Hungary. And I think that's exactly what we have in the United States right now. We have politicians, and I won't say it's only Trump, um, who, uh, who are happy to take uh, resources from whoever on, uh, on different sides of this issue and even play up the issue um, you know, so maybe this explains why you would sell Javelin missiles to Russia. Well, that, I mean, to Ukraine, it makes you more valuable an asset for Russia, right? Um, so a lot of Trump's transgressions against Russia are a way of increasing the price, right, of his loyalty. Um, so, so I think that, that you can play those games and, and it's profitable in a, in a monetary sense uh, for your campaign. It also helps to elevate your power when you have people willing to pay and provide resources. Right. Now, so uh, I, I just have two more questions before we um, open it up to audience comments. Um, do you think it's possible that Russia was already putting Trump under pressure to refuse to turn over the congressional military aid before Giuliani, as it seems, came up with the plan of tying that aid to assistance in defeating the Bidens? I'm sorry, so your question is? Do you is, think it's possible that, that, that Trump was already aware uh, from Putin mm -hmm. that Putin didn't want him to deliver that It's aid? possible. It's very possible. I mean, it, it's totally conceivable. Again, you know, one of the things we don't know about Trump is we don't, he, he's, he's entered a lot of meetings with Putin without note takers. Right. Um, right. So there's a lot that we don't know presently, phone calls that don't have note takers. So, uh, but you're saying the idea that he's carrying out a Russian agenda because of his indebtedness, alliance, fear, uh, what have you, of Putin is, is correct, but only so far as it goes. So I would put it this way, that um, from the Russian perspective, but I put myself in a Russian perspective for a second, and I ask, how do I like Trump, right? So I think that Trump is a bad debtor uh -huh. from their perspective. Uh -huh. right? Trump is the guy who you made a deal with him, you donated to his campaign, you provided all sorts of support, right? PR support. He was supposed to drop sanctions. And then, whoops, somebody heard about it in the Republican Congress voted that he can't drop sanctions. Right. That was the CASA Act, where 98 Republicans in the Senate, uh, Republicans and Democrats in the Senate, voted to say that the, that the president cannot drop sanctions against Russia unless they get congressional approval. Right. So that said to me that all Republicans know that, this, that, that he was a risk, at risk of dropping sanctions, tied his hands on this, and also gave him the ability to add more sanctions at will, which he may use. Um, so, uh, so he didn't do it. He, he didn't deliver for the Russians, right? He didn't deliver. So then the question became, well, you know, you're a bad debtor. You know, I can break your knees, or you can start delivering something, right? Uh -huh. So the way I, I read a lot of his behavior is he, he tends to be kind of solicitous, um, placating, placating towards Russia. Um, they've they've introduced the narrative. Well, he's really on our side, but. You know, he can't really do certain things, so, but they'll ask him to do other things that he can do, essentially. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so now just a, sort of a final question about, about the impeachment. I mean, you made a passing remark, um, and we've talked about it before, that the GOP, you believe, was receiving Russian funds. Mm -hmm. Do you tie that to, first of all, do you have, what, what, uh, what proof do you have? Well, I think we went through that before. There's uh, the, through the NRA. Is there it? have been investigations launched and then quashed into the NRA money. I mean, I, I believe that the, look, the, the money came in a variety of different ways. So there was that house everybody talks about that, right. that Trump bought for a certain amount and sold for a certain for amount, vastly for twice, more. twice the amount. Right, down the floor. There were there were a lot of different channels. Like Russia doesn't usually play just one channel, right? They're they're playing a lot of different channels. Okay. A lot of different channels of money going in, and it should have been investigated more. I thought it would be under the Miller report, actually. 
But, um, but I think the one we know the most about is the NRA, right, where... That was then supporting Republican we know, for instance, senators and, and congressmen. Absolutely. We know, for instance, that the NRA leadership was going to conferences in Moscow, that Putina was really successful in setting them up, mm -hmm. you know, her fake organization in Moscow, and that they were really thrilled about that and were embracing that. Uh, it, it caused several leadership changes in the NRA because people were too compromised with that scandal. Um, we know that Torshin was a frequent appearance at uh, you know NRA things in the in the jacket given to big donors. I don't think there's any mystery there, I, but I think that the my opinion is that the money came in um, probably the amounts is in the tens of millions, and a lot of the money went out the door <laughs> to the presidential campaign. But of course, money's fungible, right? Right. And and if you look at who the NRA donates to, which is all public record, right. right it donates to mostly Republican um, right. GOP con congressional candidates. I don't believe that, by the way, that most uh, GOP congressmen knew about that at the time. Okay. I suspect that um, that we'll find that the RNC and certain leadership organizations did know about this, um, but um, there are certain people who probably knew and certain people who didn't know. But I think that that it's very hard to explain to me the GOP behavior when clearly the United States was attacked and clearly they've been extremely reluctant to investigate these things. Um, you know, just by the fact that they're protecting Trump. I don't think they're protecting Trump. I think they're protecting themselves. So if I were to ask you the, the big question, you know, given that Mitch McConnell has spent a career detesting Russia, believing in support for Ukraine, that, that mm -hmm. he comes from that side of the GOP and that many of his colleagues do as well. What explains their profound allegiance to this president in the face of evidence of the president's willing to, willingness to sell out Ukraine? I, I think it's complicated. I think that um, Mitch McConnell and other Republican leaders know about all those things that I've been talking about so far. Um, so that's my opinion. But I also think that that um, there's another piece of it. You know, in as far as I talk to Republican sort of uh, lobbyists and others, you know, what, what I see is that Mitch McConnell and others believe that they could control the president, right? Um, they believe that, that, for instance, the CATS Act, right? Okay, he wants to drop sanctions on Russia. Well, guess what? We're not going to let him do that. We're not going to mm -hmm. allow him to do that. Um, that's why I think the, the sort of Syria episode was such a, the, the Kurdish, mm -hmm. Turkish episode in Syria was such a big shock to people. But even then, you know, from the GOP side, you could say, well, we kind of dealt with that, right? You know, mm -hmm. that, that um, Trump unilaterally allowed Turkey to come in and conquer parts of Kurdish held territory in Syria. And subsequently, the Republicans made a big fuss about that, got extremely angry. And within days, Mike Pence had flown over and right. told Turkey to stop. Right. And, um, and the situation was resolved. I don't think they're very happy about it. But I think they're under a, a possibly false uh, set of sense of awareness. That they that, can keep this guy under control. Yeah, that he's just a loose cannon, but he's achieving certain goals for us. We can keep him under control. And again, I don't think that, so it's, it's worth protecting him, but honestly, I think they're protecting themselves. I think that's what we're going to find you know, at the end of the day in a couple years. Now, from the, from the bird's eye view, um, from 20,000 feet, is, is this the way of the new warfare? Is this the form that our greatest national security challenges are going to take? And if so, how do we adapt to that? Yeah. Well, That's you know, really the big question. You, you've had H.R. McMaster here, who's yeah. a great strategist, yeah. military strategist. I think um, that he has it right. I think that is a, a big feature of what's going forward. I mean, I think nuclear war is too costly. It's too costly, right? We can't really fight a nuclear war against Russia. We can do that, but I mean, why would it be beneficial to anybody, right? It would it would be very devastating. Similarly with China, right? So we're in a sort of a world now where um, conflict, even to some extent conventional conflict, is just too damaging, except at a more smaller and regional scale. There's all these nuclear threats. And so, and yet states have to, they have an urge to sort of get things done. And the Russians have demonstrated, I think, pretty effectively that you can get things done in another way. And I think that the U.S. is arming up in these, um, you know, sort of uh, hybrid 
uh, techniques. Well, we lag behind, don't we? Not only do we lag behind the Russians, we lag behind the Chinese. Maybe lag behind the North Koreans. I wouldn't say so in terms of capabilities. I would think we have more parity um, with in this in this sphere than than in other spheres. But I think the United States has a lot of capabilities and has vested a lot technologically in, into these things. Some of our best uh, approaches have been leaked, unfortunately. Yes, right. Um, and we're more subject to that than other countries. Probably. All right. Well, let's invite our audience to participate in this discussion. And um, there's lots of hands in the air. I see I'm very glad. Do we have uh, someone with another microphone, or we just have the one? So we can get two mics and people's hands at once. And if you wouldn't mind, just uh, especially because we have so many distinguished scholars with us here today who were for the conference that we're embarking on, if you could just stand up and introduce sure. yourself. Sure. Yeah, you Ed Bear at the uh, US Naval Academy. Uh, so what is Putin's geopolitical endgame? Um, defensive, offensive, if offensive, what? And what does a post-Putin Russia look like? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, you know, the, the whole question, like, there's been a big debate about whether Putin is a good, is he a good strategist, really? Is this strategy really working for Russia? And I think the jury's a little bit out on that. I mean, I think one side of that says, oh yeah, he's brilliant. This is like, he's playing multi-dimensional chess and we're playing checkers, you know? I guess I don't really agree with that. I, I, the other side of it is that he's a good tactician, but he doesn't have a strategic vision. And there I would, I think, agree with you. That, um, you know, his vision is in a way, the Russian vision is built out of a sort of deep uh, defensiveness. They feel, like what's, what's crazy about the discourse, if you look at Russian versus American discourse, is we feel like we're under attack. But the Russians even more feel like they're under attack. In fact, their propaganda going every day on the TV is saying, the Americans are coming to get us, right? And they're undermining this, undermining that. And, and they sort of will say parody, like, oh, look, Mitch Ornstein says that you know, the Russia is under, the U.S. is under attack, but we think we're under attack more so. He's just covering this up, and everything he's saying we're doing to them, they're doing to us, you know, doubly, you know, kind of thing. So, um, I think that, to me, um, the end game is defensive. Uh, and it, it's basically, they don't want us, they see us as likely to attack them, and going to attack them, potentially going to attack them, having it in for them in various ways. They're quite paranoid in various respects and quite unrealistic in various respects. But they believe all this, and so they think it's necessary for them to defend themselves by, um, by you know, taking the actions that they've taken. However, the consequence of that has been that they've gotten very painful economic sanctions that have slowed down their economy, slowed down economic growth, and made it harder for Putin to gain popularity. In fact, he's shrunk in popularity domestically from what we can tell. So um, there's a trade-off for them, right? Do we continue to have this confrontational attitude towards the West, but we lose economic growth? For now, that's the decision. I don't see that being a decision longer term. I think it's a bad strategy for Russia. I think that any future Russian administration would be at least a little bit more um, you know, interested in having some sort of accommodation with the West. Although that's not at all there. You have a question over here somewhere? Yeah. Sure. Um, my name is Spencer. I'm a senior here studying economics and political science. Took your course in communism, obviously, last year. Uh, my question is about European Union ascension. So member states over the past few months have discussed ascension for member uh, states potentially such as Albania and North Macedonia. So I'm curious to hear your opinion on whether this tour or U EU membership potential can be used as a tour or a counter strategy against these types of hybrid warfare tactics. Yeah, I mean, in, in the Balkans, are you speaking about the Balkans in particular? I mean, in the Balkans, it definitely is, right? So that Europe sees that it can expand. Europe feels that the Balkans are kind of its backyard and wants to expand its influence in the Balkans. Russia is also countering with a number of different diplomatic and covert techniques to try to keep a number of the Bal Balkan states kind of on side. So particularly Serbia, but others as well. Um, and uh, they use those same variety of techniques, you know, oil deals, you know, uh, coup support, you know, uh, paying off politicians, buying up politicians, <laughs> use of economic leverage, buying, you know, large shares in industry, for instance, in the countries. Um, so I, I, I believe that what's emerging in the Balkans right now, unfortunately, is more of a kind of standoff situation where both sides have considerable amount of leverage 
um, and it's it's slowing down. If if it ever was sped up, it's it's making more uncertain the kind of I thought that some of these countries are now going to be members of the European Union. I think it's um, it's weakened that 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 possibility. I think. Where I thought you were going to go, the question was more, you know, could that be, a, a, you know, for Russia or for Belarus an in incentive? And I think that the problem with Russia-EU relations is that Russia doesn't operate in an economic way in a, at all similarly to the European Union, which operates according to a very legalistic uh, and highly rule-bound sort of system. And Russia is not at all legalistic and not at all rule-bound. It, it it's very changeable, like everything is last minute. Uh, and so Russia had a very hard time getting anything out of the EU um, because it simply didn't operate in compatible ways uh, economically. Um, so I think they gave up on the EU, and, and that may have been one of the big reasons that they gave up on the West in general, is they didn't feel that they could really uh, participate as a full member in the European Union economy. And who's next? So, what, oh, so, yeah, so, the mic? I'm Steve Crowley, Oberlin College. Thank you, Mitchell, for a uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion. You, you mentioned at the beginning how this, the, Russia was engaging in these asymmetric measures, partly because of this basically power dis, uh, unbalanced disbalance. So I guess one question would be, how is Russia able to have this outsized impact given this power yeah. imbalance? And then anticipating you know, so one p p potential answer to that might be, well, maybe the, the West needs to engage in these same sort of tactics in order to, so that would lead to a, to a second question, which would be, is the answer to the Russia situation, or are we in a deterrence situation where we need to deter Russia, we need to kind of show it that we're going to be tough, we're going to push back, or are we in a, in a security dilemma situation, mm -hmm. which in Russia's anxiety, its defensiveness, you did mention NATO expansion as a pre mm -hmm. precipitating factor to all of us. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. I, I, I often used to premise like my remarks when I was talk talk to um, audiences to say, look, there's there's dovish perspectives on Russia and hawkish perspectives on Russia. Generally, I'm more hawkish on Russia. I think, but one of the dovish perspectives, which is not entirely wrong, is just that look, Russia is too weak really to be a major threat. I hear this, you know, frequently. You know, it's how could it be a major threat? So there are two answers I would give to that. One is they have a lot of nuclear weapons. So in the nuclear area, they are not a small power. They're a major power, right? And they're threatening us all the time with nuclear weapons. We could we could prefer not to listen to that and hear it, or to think that they're not serious. But um, I think that would be interesting. But I would also say that you know the United States is a country which was defeated in war by a bunch of Vietnamese peasants with AK-47s. Am I right, wrong about that? Um, and you know, the whole idea that asymmetric conflict cannot work, I think, is, is wrong. Uh, I would also point out that Russia, Russia has scored most of its major foreign policy successes through spying. Right? It has, a, as you know, a really, really long tradition of extensive spy, spying on its own people and, and externally going back to the Tsarist era of the Ukraine. And, um, you know, Russia got nuclear weapons, right, the hydrogen bomb, by spying on the U.S., right? It got the atomic weapon, you know, also by spying on the U.S. Um, so, so I think it's very plausible that it relies heavily on spy techniques, not to mention that its current president is a former KGB officer who is also put in place the biggest proportion ever in Russian history of uh, intelligence officers in all the major positions in Russia. I mean, this is an intelligence-run operation that they have there. Um, so yeah, I think it's totally plausible to me that you know a bigger power could be defeated by a weaker power in asymmetric conflict. It's happened before in my lifetime in the United States. And, and in the book, you, you do say that there's no doubt in your mind that we're in a security dilemma. That's true. Yeah, that's the other Russia. piece of the question. So that said, you know, I want to say that, of course, you're right that uh, our perception is very different from Russia's perception. So Russia's perception is that, um, you know, has whether they're right or wrong, right, the whole thing about a security dilemma is that if they perceive that they're threatened, that's a problem, right? And they're going to sort of escalate, and then they're going to do something that we perceive as a problem, and we're going to escalate. So I would rather say that we're in a security dilemma. Um, and let's just explain. The reason, the reason the question is a, a good one is that 
if you're in a security dilemma with a country, then you don't want to go for a deterrence strategy because it's only going to worsen the situation because they're going to feel increasingly threatened and so arm up or start attacking in these covert ways all the more, right? So this is, this is what I was talking about with regard to the, um, with regard to, um, you know, the Javelin missiles, right? The, the Obama administration approach was that we want to respond um, to this military attack in Ukraine, but we're just going to respond with economic measures because we don't want to give Russia any impression that we're about to invade. And so, so to sell Javelin missiles, for instance, would be Highly a provocation. Provocative. And therefore, we, don't, we want to shy away from doing that. The problem, however, with that was that um, that didn't work. <laughs> Right. They, they continued to, uh, to be uh, highly provocative and, and insisted on keeping Crimea, et cetera. So, um, so I think that that's, you know, you're in a security dilemma. I mean, the, there, there isn't a good way to get out of a security dilemma. I know in theory you could, you could say, oh, we'll just, you know, like back off and then it'll prove. But in this situation, if we back off, they're going to advance, right? So, um, because, you know, the things that they want, I mean, Russia's listed, Putin's listed very clearly what he wants, right? And he said uh, a few years ago that what he would want is the U.S. to withdraw uh, troop levels in Europe back to the lowest level it had achieved, I think, in 2009 or something like that, or 2001, right? To give Russia um, security control over all of its, basically, the former Soviet Union, um, you know, and, and to pay reparations for the sanctions. Right. That we've we've uh, cost them a few percent of their economy, and we need to pay that back. Um, and then they would be happy with us, and then we could have a great relationship. The the reason the the dilemma here, I think, is that is that, you know, and th this is where a lot of left thinkers, I think, go wrong on Russia, is is viewing it entirely in the perspective of U.S. Russia relations. It's not about U.S. Russia. It's about Russia versus the West, right? And that's because there's a whole lot of other countries that have these relationships with Russia that are allies that all have different interests. And in particular, Ukraine, like if you do a thought experiment and you say, okay, we accede to everything Russia wants and then they take over Ukraine, right, effectively, right? Is that a solved security situation? No, because Ukraine's not gonna stand for it. Ukraine, 60% of Ukrainians wanna go to the West at this point, right? They've been convinced by the events of the past few years that Russia's not their friend. And they want anything but to stay in the Russian sphere of influence. And I'll remind you that, that in, in the history of the 20th century, the security challenges, the, the major wars that occurred in Europe were all sparked off by, by conflicts over smaller powers. Right? So the First World War was not you know, an out-and-out -out conflict of great powers. It was sparked because a Serbian nationalist who wanted independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire threw a bomb into the carriage of Archduke Ferdinand of Serbia, of, of Austria-Hungary, and blew him up. And that set off this kind of like, you know, thing. Similarly, in the Second World War, it was fought over Poland at the end of the day, right? It was, it was the, this great agreement, a great power agreement. It was a perfect agreement, right, to point of phrase, right, between Germany and Russia. It said, look, we, we don't want to have conflict. Right, so let's get rid of the security dilemma. We'll just draw a line down the middle of Europe, right? And you take over these countries, we'll take over the other countries. Well, that wasn't acceptable to the Poles, right? And, and so the, the kind of, um, I think that the U.S.-Russia perspective on international relations falls into this great power view of the world that Russia tries to promote and has, that we could sort this all out if the great powers just got together and had a conference like at you know Versailles or something, and, and carved up Europe again, you know, into spheres. And, and the reason that doesn't work is because Europe is a is a continent of smaller powers. Right? It has a lot of small nations. In fact, I brought a little map. <laughs> right. Um, it's a continent of small powers. And what's interesting about the current institutions, why I believe personally in the current institutions of NATO and the European Union, if you think about it, is that they, they accommodate great power interests, right? Nobody would, you know, everybody says about NATO, like the US is preponderant, Germany is preponderant, true. But I would argue that in the case of NATO, the country that has, in a way, the greatest benefit from NATO is the smallest country in NATO. Mm -hmm. Because the smallest country in NATO 
um, has the assurance that if they get invaded, everybody else is going to come to their aid, right? The cavalry is coming, right? Likewise, in the European Union, um, the European Union today is often talked about and you know as a German Empire, right, or is a, a unit in which Germany has a kind of preponderance. But in fact, the European Union gives huge benefits to the smaller states. The Visegrad countries of so Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland have more voting strength in the European Union than Germany does. Okay. Um, the smaller powers are, the whole purpose of that design is to give smaller powers a say in decision making structures. Plus, they get a commissioner each, right? There's like 17 different ministries in the European Union run by commissioners, and they have to each be from one of the different member states, which gives politicians in each of these countries an important voice in European affairs. Of course, the voice of Denmark is not as great as that of Germany. But uh, you can be assured as a smaller power that you are not going to be traded off to somebody else. Mitch, let me stop you so we can get a few more sure. questions yeah. in. And, and now Sorry keep your about response is brief. Long. Sorry about going too <laughs> so long. That, that was a great more. question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you mind standing up? Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, my name is Elaine Foltz, and I'm formerly with the International Labor Organization, which is one of the UN agencies where I was the director of the Moscow office. And I wanted to ask two questions, um, one about the UK and one about Moldova. You said earlier that the level of information about Russian activities in the UK is lower than it is here. But the case of the Skripal poisoning mm -hmm. strikes me as possibly an exception to that, where we yeah. had this Bellingcat organization that did incredible cyber investigation to actually identify the killers. I wonder to have your comments on that. And second, in Moldova, we had an election, a rather unusual election a few months ago, where a new coalition came to power, um, pro-European, anti-corruption, dynamic new leader, a young woman who had worked for the World Bank, and for a moment in time had the support of Russia and the EU and the US. But that didn't last. And I wonder, it, coalition seems to have fallen apart, and I wonder if you see Russian uh, involvement, Russian fingerprints in that development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on Skripal, you're, that's a really good point. I mean, Skripal, that was a case where Russia, a Russian security, intelligence operation used a, a, a nerve agent, you know, a, a registered chemical weapon to attempt to kill a former Russian spy who was living in, in Salisbury, who'd been subject to a trade swap, a spy swap. And so, um, and that was highly publicized. And in fact, um, there was an investigation into that. Britain clearly blamed Russia for that. And there were even some gratifications that came out of that. The uh, UK uh, began to demand that Russians buying property in the UK uh, register uh, the, the, uh, where their money came from. So that was a kind of interesting step that they took. So, um, so yeah, I, I would agree with that. The uh, second piece of the question, or the second question is, sorry. About Moldova. Right, Moldova. So I've written a lot about Moldova. Um, you know, In fact, the book sort of started out as a book about Moldova, right? <laughs> or are you suggesting Well, I say in the first line of the book is, yeah. is that this is not a book about Moldova. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it is sort of is. And um, you know, the, the thing about that, so um, I, I mentioned Vlad Plotnyuk, the, the former kingpin of Moldova. He actually, in the election of earlier this year, was ousted and he went into exile. Interestingly, this is a guy I talked about before. He's in exile, I, I believe, in Miami, according to reports. I mean, this is, that I don't know. That's just from press reports. But presumably, he's in Miami because uh, he trusted the US, presumably, to give him safe harbor. And he would only leave um, if he was given safe harbor. So anyway, he left. But he was displaced, as you mentioned, by Russia, really. I mean, where basically um, he had planned out with the pro-Russia party in Moldova that he was going to, even though he had a pro-EU party and they had a pro-Russia party, he was going to ally with them after the election to sort of milk the country, you know, dry in various ways, like is sort of robber baron, right? And the thing was that the, the pro-Russia party in Moldova was owned so directly by the Kremlin that they called them in and said, you're not going to form this coalition with this guy because they had been worried about him. And so they kicked him out. And instead, um, the coalition happened between the pro-Russia party and the legitimate pro-EU party, which had about 25% of the vote. 
And people at the time said, oh, you know, Ornstein, you're totally wrong about this. You know, look, you can have this pro-Russia, pro-EU government, right? It lasted like a couple months, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason it lasted a couple months is because obviously these two uh, platforms, you know, a pro-Russia approach and a pro-EU, is totally incompatible in these countries. It's just not possible. It's like right now the rule of law is not compatible with, you know, um, you know. Rule by Kremlin. Yeah, Kremlin rule, right? I mean, it's just not. And so, um, so now they have a minority government of the Russia party. All right, let's get another question in here. Let's take two questions because we're running out of time. So we'll take one, two, and then you can answer both together. Andrew Filipovich of counsel at the Barnes White Law Firm. Professor, uh, aren't the uh, democratic societies really at a distinct disadvantage in this hybrid information warfare as compared to, for example, Russia, which is really a closed society? I mean, we can't go there and create an NGO. There's no NRA there that we can go and, and, and influence. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Yeah, I, I mean, democracies, insofar as they're open societies, you know, I, I would conceive a democracy in some ways as an open system. Like, anybody can come in and do whatever they want in the United States. That's part of the DNA, right? So you're right that we're more vulnerable in a certain sense, right? Because, um, because other actors have many more avenues into our country and many more ways to influence, right? Um, and Russia definitely does check. Like I, last I checked, I don't think they even let CNN be broadcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're, um, they have tighter, tight media controls. Um, they have, you know, increasingly restrictive laws about what you can post on social media. I hear from my academic colleagues. I often ask them, "Are you under any pressure?" And in the past years, actually, they haven't really bothered too much with academia. But now I'm starting to hear reports that uh, if you fall out of line a little bit, you might you know, lose your job or be punished in various ways. So they're, they're progressively cracking down. And it, of course, does mean that they're a little more, you know, not so vulnerable to, in a certain way to, to things. But um, I think you have to look at it from another way, too, that, that, you know, democracy is a huge advantage in a lot of ways, right? I mean, so democracy enables us to have a thriving economy in a lot of ways because if you weren't allowed to, you know, speak or share information, that would really cut down on our ability to uh, produce high tech, you know, sort of uh, innovations. All right, now stop there, because I, I meant to get two questions at a time. Sure. Here's the second one. Yeah, hi, uh, Bob Mann, I'm a Penn Law graduate, practicing Philadelphia attorney. Uh, two part question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the U.S. has the capability to respond mm -hmm. in this particular manner, similar manner. So the one question is, you know, we have it, are we doing it? And the second part is you aptly describe this as not Russia versus the U.S., Russia versus the West. Mm -hmm. And as I look at the map, without the U.S. even there, I see one Russia and I see a whole lot of Western pieces. Yeah. And my question is, uh, is it even possible with so many parts of the Western world with maybe disparate interests, how is it even possible to have a coordinated coalition of the West to combat what Russia is doing? Yeah, that's a really great dilemma to pose. I mean, certainly what you say is true, that Russia is a unitary state, and we can understand it better, and it, it acts and has strategies and things. But how is the West coordinated? I mean, I think on this issue, I think there's a, it's a complex system. The way it often works is that the frontline states like Poland and the Baltic states will make demands within the Western institutions, like we need protection, please protect us. Um, I had the luck of, of meeting with the <coughs> Lithuanian ambassador to the US this morning. And he was saying that at the recent NATO summit, essentially, Poland and the, and the Baltic states wanted uh, more NATO support in terms of troops, armaments, uh, to be placed there. They faced a lot of difficult negotiations. At the end of the day, they got those things, um, presumably because, not because they're so powerful, but because the other bigger states sort of allied with them. So it's complex, the politics within these organizations, but I would, I would say that it's not totally directed by the big states, but, um, but, but generally speaking, Decisions are made by the big states, but a lot of times these smaller states can kind of set the agenda. 
in those organizations. Now, you could say it's unwieldy, and I would guess I would agree, but you know, frankly, the European Union has been a remarkably successful organization in a lot of different ways in many, many different fields, um, despite the fact that they have 28 uh, member states. Um, so they've developed techniques, and one of them is just log rolling. Um, so for instance, if there's very, very seldom do they have um, decisions held up by one country, because basically if, if there's a preponderance of interest on one side, they'll find some way to pay off the other side. It's like horse trading or log rolling, you know, where they pay off the one state that's like a stickler. Like, so for instance, why is Hungary always voting for sanctions when Hungary's president has said, or prime minister said he's against sanctions? <laughs> Which I've written a paper about that, by the way. And the answer is simply because he can use that to get something else. And you're always willing to, you're always able to pay off the smaller guy at the end of the day to sort of get do, past. Do you feel this. that the U.S. is using its capabilities that you mentioned we have yes. to deal with these attacks by? Well, not to the extent that we could. So in the 2018 election, it sounds like we shut down the troll farm in St. Petersburg, you know, using attack methods against their servers. Um, so we do have the capabilities. Occasionally we're using them, but I think the whole drama within the Trump administration, you know, and really that's touching on this impeachment inquiry is, are they willing to use this or are they willing to trade it away for some type of temporary gain? And, and what I hear people saying is that um, they have more capabilities than they've uh, been told to use and are quite frustrated. A lot of people who have developed those things are quite frustrated that they haven't been used to, to an extent. Well, we are unfortunately out of time because I could go on listening to you talk on this very important subject for, for quite a lot longer. Uh, we will be having a reception outside. I hope you will all join us and please join me in, in thanking Mitch Ornstein.